What's up y'all? It's me again, back with another ARC video, and today we're- What? Oh, oh this? <laughs> oh, this, this is my merch. You want me to model it for you? Well, only because you asked. Look at this, you know, it, it's, it's not too bad for the first time, you know, it, it's not too bad. What you think? What do you think? It's all right though. You know, I, I kind of like it. I think it, I think it looks real, real sleek on such a, such a handsome individual like myself. Yeah, you know, I, I released some new merch or whatever. Um, right now it only consists of the shirt, you know, as of this recording or whatever. So you guys can go check out the little store tab on my channel. If you guys want to, you know, rep Justin's Den at any point in time, you know, and I took the little name off of it. Cause I figure, you know, if it were me, I wouldn't want to be walking around with somebody's name on me. But who doesn't want to walk around with Tappy on them? But for real, man, I appreciate all y'all support. You know what I'm saying? Anybody who does pick it up, um, thank you. But anyway, that's not why we're here. Red Ribbon Army Arc today. I hope you guys enjoy the video. Just so you guys know, I'm doing the Universe 6 Saga next. So right after this video, for those who have been asking, yes, the Universe 6 and 7 tournament, that video will be next. Usually I'm choosing between two videos and we do a little light goal or whatever just to, just to decide what the video is going to be. But since the video is already decided, we can still do like goal anyway that being said let's see if we can get to 1500 likes on this video and i would say that'll be the next saga we cover but it's already gonna be the next saga we cover you know i gotta take a moment to thank all of my channel members man i really appreciate you guys who've been sticking around even some of you guys who've been dropping off and hopping back on like i see you and also to my subscribers man my supporters like y'all the la the 10 hour video i dropped it's like almost nothing but positivity in those comments bro like it's literally Literally crazy. I did not expect that much positive feedback for that video. I even got an email, you guys. An email telling me how much my content helps you guys. Like, y'all really feel that way? That's amazing, bro. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. And to the, the person that sent that email, man, thank you. Much love. But I took up enough time for you guys already. Let's get into the video. The Red Ribbon Arc takes place after the events of the 21st Tenkaichi Budokai. Time has passed since the conclusion of the tournament. Goku is soaring through the air on the flying Nimbus, traversing a wooded, mountainous region. He halts by a river for a refreshing drink and consults the dragon radar given to him by Bulma. The device indicates a dragon ball situated northeast, and Goku takes off to investigate. Meanwhile, at two capsule houses with a pickup truck parked outside, a cowboy awakens. A man in a trench coat donning a scarf informs him that it's already 8 o'clock, and the cowboy Boy addresses him as Silver. Silver instructs the cowboy to get to work, and he hops in the truck with a wolf-like companion. Silver discloses that someone named Commander Red has tasked them with swiftly locating a certain artifact, mentioning that one of their other squads has already found one yesterday. Silver tells the two in the truck not to waste time, as if they don't find what they're looking for, they'll all be killed. The truck departs, and Silver reveals that the sought-after item is a Dragon Ball. The cowboy, frustrated about searching for a small ball in such a vast area, Area, rummages through the bushes. Suddenly, the fox companion notices something approaching. Goku swoops in on the flying Nimbus, lands, and inspects the dragon radar. He surveys the surroundings, prompting the two men to warn him to move aside or face consequences, with a cowboy brandishing a gun. Undeterred, Goku approaches and discovers the six-star ball between two rocks, expressing a bit of disappointment that it was in his grandpa's memento, the four-star ball. Assuming the item in his hand to be the dragon ball, the two men are shocked, wondering who Goku is and how he managed to find it so easily. The cowboy demands Goku to hand over the Dragon Ball as he aims his gun at him, and Goku questions their intentions, prompting the cowboy to threaten him. Goku, defiant, sticks out his tongue, and the cowboy attempts to take the Dragon Ball from him. However, Goku retaliates, kicking him into the distance. The fox companion opens fire, but Goku skillfully evades the bullets, closing in to deliver a punch and kick that sends the assailant flying. Securing the six-star ball, Goku takes off, and the cowboy staggers back to the truck, contacting Silver via radio. Now aware of the situation, Silver emerges from his capsule house with a missile launcher and fires at Goku, scoring a direct hit and destroying the flying Nimbus. Despite Nimbus's destruction though, Goku lands unharmed, noticed by Silver. Goku questions what drove this stranger to destroy his flying Nimbus, but Silver dismisses this, questioning Goku on why he's collecting the Dragon Balls and how he was able to find them so easily. Angered, Goku refuses to divulge information about the Dragon Balls to Silver due to the harm inflicted on the flying Nimbus, to which Silver removes his coat and warns Goku not to underestimate the Red Ribbon's Colonel Silver. Silver persists in questioning Goku, who chooses to ignore him and walk away. Determined, Silver rushes forward, snatching Goku's sack he'd been carrying with him and inquires if the radar
Radar is inside. However, an infuriated Goku swiftly rushes in and reclaims his possession, much to the surprise of Colonel Silver. Recognizing Goku as no ordinary youngster, Silver asserts he'll have to beat the information out of Goku and boasts that he'll defeat him in five seconds. Despite throwing a punch, Goku effortlessly ducks and delivers a kick to Silver's gut. Staggering backward, Silver attempts a frustrated kick, but Goku effortlessly evades, using his tail to strike Silver in the face, rendering him unconscious. As Goku ponders his next move without the flying Nimbus, realizing the considerable distance to the next Dragon Ball, he deduces that Silver's capsule house likely contains useful items. Discovering a case full of capsules inside, Goku attempts to locate a mode of transportation and tosses one, revealing a robot. Greetings are exchanged between the two, and the robot questions what Goku wants. Goku expresses a desire to travel a long distance and seek something to ride in, and the robot suggests trying capsule number three in the case. Goku throws the capsule into the distance, and a plane emerges. Though Goku insists he can't fly it, the robot assures him it can pilot, and the two embark on their journey. Far in the west lies the Red Ribbon Army headquarters, where Commander Red, a short man with an eye patch and cigar, complains to his tall assistant about the slow progress in obtaining the Dragon Balls. Suddenly, a Red Ribbon subordinate interrupts, reporting an issue with the Dragon Ball pursued by Colonel Silver. In the control room, Commander Red notices the Dragon Ball moving on the radar, headed north towards someone named General White's area. Wondering what this could mean, Commander Red instructs the subordinate to contact Colonel Silver for an explanation. As the phone rings at Silver's location, the Colonel regains consciousness and limps toward his capsule house. Meanwhile, in the plane, Goku notes the increasing cold weather as they head north, prompting the robot to clarify that robots don't feel the cold. At the same time, Commander Red seeks information on the formidable adversary, who supposedly has a superior radar capable of locating Dragon Balls faster. Discovering their adversary is nothing but a child, Commander Red orders Silver's execution for his incompetence. Red then instructs his assistant to contact General White to eliminate the child and secure the Dragon Ball. As Goku questions the sudden chill, the robot attributes it to the northern region. Consulting the Dragon Radar, Goku locates the Dragon Ball just below them and tells the robot to land. However, the robot freezes, leading the two to plummet from the sky and crash. Nearby, two Red Ribbon soldiers spot the crash near the well-guarded White Squad base. In the control room, a Russian-looking figure receives word of a plane crash, deducing it to be the child they heard about. The soldiers are instructed to search for Goku, but discover he's missing. They're commanded to continue their search, and at the same time, a little girl drags Goku's frozen body from the snow. The White Squad base, now known as Muscle Tower, is under the command of General White. He persistently directs his men to retrieve the Dragon Ball and radar from the young Goku, even if they have to kill him. Meanwhile, the red-haired little girl pulls Goku to a village where she knocks on the door, informing her mother about finding a kid. After some time, Goku, wrapped in a blanket next to a fireplace, regains consciousness. Inquiring about his location, Goku learns he's in Jingle Village. The girl's mother offers him hot cocoa, explaining that her daughter saved him, as if she hadn't, Goku would have died in the cold for sure. The little girl wonders what Goku was doing out in the cold, and he recounts his quest for the Dragon Balls and the plane crash. Upon hearing about the Dragon Balls, the villagers express fear, questioning if Goku is affiliated with the Red Ribbon Army. Outside, two soldiers discover Goku's tracks in the snow, and decide to follow it and investigate. Curious about the Red Ribbon Army's motives, Goku learns that even the girl and her mother are unaware. He shares his goal of obtaining his grandpa's memento ball and displays this six star ball, elucidating that gathering all seven summons a large dragon capable of granting any wish you desire. The mother speculates that the Red Ribbon Army must be planning to make an evil wish, and Goku suggests a dragon ball should be nearby. The little girl reveals that they're aware, and states that the village men, including her father, are being forced by the Red Ribbon Army to search for it. When Goku proposes confronting the army, she warns of their formidable strength, pointing to their base outside and revealing that their village mayor is being held hostage. Equipping the power pole, Goku resolves to confront the army himself as a thanks for being saved. The little girl cautions him about the danger, but he remains determined. Suddenly, two soldiers burst in, telling Goku to hand over the Dragon Ball. Unconcerned, Goku inquires if one of the men is the girl's father. Finding out they aren't, Goku swiftly dispatches the intruders with a flurry of kicks, which suddenly causes them to fall over unconscious. Surprised, the little girl questions what happened, and Goku states he punched the men six times and delivered four kicks. He declares he'll defeat the rest of the army now and takes off, but returns shortly after, stating it's too cold to go outside. The girl then offers to let Goku borrow her clothes, and as he dons them, he notes he doesn't feel cold anymore. Goku then takes off, as the girl and her mother note that Goku is weird, but a nice boy. 
Approaching Muscle Tower, a soldier alerts General White about an approaching kid, likely the one they've been searching for. White orders his elimination, leading the soldiers to open fire. Goku, however, skillfully blocks the bullets with a power pole, extends it, and whacks the lot of them in a swift move, incapacitating them. With a pole vault, Goku ascends to the second floor outside, impressing General White, who contemplates whether the kid can reach the tower's top floor. While Goku ponders the whereabouts of the village mayor, General White initiates communication through the PA system, welcoming Goku to the tower and questioning Goku's purpose there. Goku responds that he's there to save the village mayor, and General White directs him to enter through a specific door, revealing the mayor is on the top floor. As Goku enters, four individuals on the second floor prepare themselves to fight him, and receive orders from General White to handle him as they wish. A bearded man attempts a kick, but Goku effortlessly dodges and delivers a devastating kick himself, sending the man into a wall and rendering him unconscious. Facing two more opponents, Goku dispatches one with an elbow strike and the other with a powerful kick. The final adversary fires a gun, but Goku utilizes an after image technique in the line of fire. Goku, appearing behind the gunman, taps him on the back and delivers a punch, sending him through a nearby table. Now getting hot, Goku discards the winter coat and hat. In the control room, a ninja now oversees operations with General White on a monitor. The ninja identifies the technique Goku employed as self-replication, and White inquires about the likelihood of Goku reaching the top of the tower. The ninja predicts that even if Goku defeats Sergeant Metallic on the third floor, the odds are slim against overcoming the unbeaten fourth floor opponent. Disappointed that he won't personally be able to intervene, General White notifies Sergeant Metallic of the impending confrontation. Ascending the stairs, Goku encounters Sergeant Metallic, a formidable, Terminator-like figure who greets him and tells him in order to get to the next level, he'll need to defeat him first. Metallic then throws a punch at Goku, but it merely strikes the floor. Goku, now on the ceiling hanging from a chain, descends onto Metallic's shoulder, delivering a powerful punch that knocks him down. As Goku prepares to proceed upstairs, Metallic seizes him from behind with massive hands and attempts to squeeze him to death. Demonstrating his power, Goku manages to break free and tells Metallic that he's going to attack him seriously. Goku then executes a jump kick, attacking Metallic furiously and slamming him into the wall. Despite the onslaught, Metallic manages to rise again, leaving Goku astounded. Goku admires Metallic's resilience, and Metallic forcefully stomps his foot, prompting Goku to narrowly evade by leaping into the air. While airborne, Metallic delivers a forceful punch, sending Goku bouncing off the floor and into the wall. As Metallic approaches to finish the job, Goku swiftly regains his footing, leaping up to headbutt Metallic in the chin, causing him to topple over. Despite the successful move, Goku experiences pain in his head, noting Metallic's exceptionally tough facial structure. This surprises General White and the ninja who's watching the battle, surprised Goku still has so much power. Undeterred, Metallic rises again, and shocked, Goku notes he should have entered the Tenkaichi Budokai. Suddenly, Metallic unleashes a rocket from his mouth, creating an explosion that punches a hole in the wall. It appears Metallic has emerged victorious, but Goku, unharmed behind a pillar, wonders what that move was, and contemplates the attack resembling a Kamehameha. Determined, Goku decides to unleash his own Kamehameha, revealing himself from behind the pillar, much to the surprise of Metallic, General White, and the ninja. Goku then declares his Kamehameha, and unleashes the blast toward Metallic, engulfing him in the attack. When the smoke dissipates, Metallic's head is severed, wires protruding from his neck. Concerned about having killed a man, Goku begins to pray, but suddenly, Metallic's arm begins to move slowly. His fist detaches like a rocket, striking Goku in the face, while the other fist attempts punches and swats at him. Goku evades the attacks, puzzled by the unexpected turn of events. General White then intervenes over the PA system, asserting that Sergeant Metallic is a robot. Goku resolves to use his true power, but suddenly, Metallic stops moving. The ninja informs White that Metallic's batteries have run out, and seizing the opportunity, Goku heads upstairs toward the fourth floor, prompting White to instruct the ninja to defend that level. Continuing his ascent, Goku reaches the fourth floor, finding an unusual scene with a house, grass-covered ground, and a small forest indoors. Puzzled by the outdoor setting within, Goku is suddenly met with flying kunai. Swiftly jumping onto the rocks to evade, a voice, presumably the ninja now known as Master Sergeant Murasaki, declares that Goku will meet his end on this floor. Shuriken follow, embedding into the rock as Goku takes cover. Discerning the direction of the attack, Goku throws a stone into the trees, hitting Murasaki and causing him to fall to the ground. Murasaki claims that Goku got lucky, but Goku insists otherwise, leading Murasaki to throw a smoke bomb. As the smoke clears, the ninja vanishes and asserts that Goku won't find him this time, as he's employed 
his camouflage jutsu. Goku ventures through the forest until he easily spots Murasaki, who's holding the American flag as camouflage against a tree. Annoyed by using the wrong side, Murasaki flips the flag, revealing a more suitable tree pattern camouflage. Murasaki announces his intention to use a high level hiding technique, instructing Goku to close his eyes and count to 30. Goku begins his count and reaches 18, but is uncertain of what comes next. Turning around to ask, he discovers Murasaki partially concealed under a fake rock as he yells at Goku not to look yet. Murasaki enthusiastically praises the effectiveness of the hiding spot, guiding Goku through counting to 30, and unveils his intention to use one of his special techniques. When Goku finishes the count this time, Murasaki eludes him as Goku searches the area. However, Goku hears breathing noises near a pond. He locates a reed sticking up from the pond, realizing Murasaki is using it to breathe underwater. Seizing an opportunity, Goku retrieves a steaming pot of water from the house and pours it down the reed. Murasaki then emerges from the water with his tongue burned, leaving him enraged. Having had enough of hiding techniques, Murasaki opts for a more direct approach. He challenges Goku to match his ninja speed and darts off through the trees. Goku pursues, almost catching up, when Murasaki scatters spikes on the ground. Despite the pain, Goku retaliates with a pair of Geta sandals, effortlessly running over the tacks and catching up to Murasaki once more, winning the race. Murasaki catches his breath while Goku joyfully dances, remarking that Goku won't make it out of Muscle Tower alive. At the same time, General White remarks on Murasaki's power, but alludes to shortcomings in his intelligence. Upon White's screams through the PA system to destroy Goku, Murasaki decides to escalate the confrontation. Drawing his katana, he declares Goku's imminent demise. Murasaki leaps into the air to attack, but Goku strategically plants the power pole in the ground, causing Murasaki to land on it awkwardly, resulting in some comedic distress. As Murasaki runs around in pain, Goku humorously points out that he now has a tail, just like him. Eventually, Goku removes the power pole from Murasaki, leading to more laughter. Enraged, Murasaki retrieves his katana and swings at Goku, who skillfully blocks with his power pole. Goku advances, and Murasaki struggles to fend off the power pole with his katana until Goku delivers a powerful swipe breaking the blade. Goku asserts the superiority of his power pole, prompting Murasaki to suggest a bare-handed fight. Goku complies, stowing away the power pole, but Murasaki suddenly hurls a curved blade at him. Goku evades, accusing Murasaki of deceit, but Murasaki insists that everything's fair in a life or death battle. The blade returns as a boomerang shuriken, striking Goku from behind and rendering him unconscious. Murasaki revels in his apparent victory, receiving praise from General White through the PA system. However, Goku begins to recover cover, much to Murasaki's surprise. Goku, now infuriated, gives chase to the ninja as he runs away scared. Murasaki throws shuriken at Goku, who manages to evade as they hit a tree. Goku retrieves them from the tree and pursues Murasaki into the house. Preparing to retaliate, Goku aims to throw the shuriken at Murasaki, who confidently kneels over the floor mats. Goku throws the first shuriken, and Murasaki catches it with the floor mat, surprising Goku. The ninja catches multiple shuriken with the floor mats, laughing at his apparent success. However, when Goku throws the sixth shuriken directly into Murasaki's forehead, the ninja notes that he didn't have enough floor mats to block them all. In pursuit of Murasaki outdoors, Goku finds himself near a lake, where Murasaki tosses another smoke bomb. As the smoke bomb dissipates, Murasaki, now wearing snow-like contraptors on his feet, showcases his water stride technique, allowing him to walk across the water. Murasaki taunts Goku about piranhas in the lake, but Goku dismisses the threat, leaping across to the other side with ease. Goku proposes a real fight, and refusing to give up, the ninja whistles, signaling to reveal his secret technique. Murasaki initiates his apparent self-replication technique, creating four additional copies of himself that surround Goku. Despite their seemingly authentic appearance, Goku discerns their reality when one throws kunai. Pursuing the suspected real Murasaki, Goku is thwarted by another ninja wielding a katana. As Goku prepares to counter, a third Murasaki fires a revolver. Confused, Goku states all the Murasaki Murasaki seem real, and realizes that they're quintuplet ninjas, all appearing genuine. The Murasakis converge on Goku, aiming to overwhelm him, but Goku employs the afterimage technique, much to their confusion. To their surprise, Goku incapacitates two of the Murasakis and glares at the remaining three, as the original comprehends Goku's mastery of the real afterimage technique. However, Goku incapacitates the remaining two Murasaki, much to the final one's shock. The last ninja retreats to a higher section of the room 
room as Goku follows close behind. He reaches a cage and tells someone named Android 8 to kill Goku, and he emerges from the shadows. Murasaki unlocks the cage, allowing Android 8 to emerge while Murasaki boasts about his strength. Instructing number 8 to attack and eliminate Goku, Murasaki's orders are met with refusal. Number 8 states that he can't kill living things, prompting surprise from Goku. He then says that he knows the Red Ribbon Army is up to no good, and insists they stop causing problems for everyone. Murasaki becomes furious, berating number 8 and expressing disbelief that he would defy his creators, the Red Ribbon Army. Number 8, however, maintains that he cannot comply, prompting Murasaki to reveal a remote controller. The ninja claims that there's a bomb in number 8's body, ready to detonate if the switch is pressed. He tells number 8 to do as he commands, otherwise he'll destroy him. Despite the threat though, number 8 stands firm, refusing to do harm. In the control room, General White deems number 8 a traitor and urges Murasaki to detonate the bomb. Preparing to activate the switch, Murasaki switches to the other side of the room to avoid the blast. However, he's interrupted by Goku, who charges in, knocks the controller from Murasaki's hand, and smashes it. Goku then uses his rock, scissors, paper technique, landing a devastating punch to Murasaki's face and renders him unconscious as he collides with a wall. Balancing on the railing, Goku approaches number 8, who expresses gratitude but says it isn't good to fight. Goku emphasizes the importance of fighting against those who will try to kill you, and number 8 admits his fear to combat. Number 8 then questions who Goku is and he introduces himself. Goku inquires the same of number 8 and he reveals his name as well. Goku finds the name peculiar but aims to save the village mayor and begins to take off. However, number 8 says he'll guide Goku to the top of the tower as it can be difficult to get there. As they ascend to a maze-like room, Goku notes he wouldn't have known where to go if he were alone and number 8 says he'd be in trouble if he got lost. Goku, addressing number 8 as Hat-chan or Aider, questions if they're still on the 5th floor and number 8 clarifies they're currently between the 4th and 5th floors. Discussing what the name Aider means, Goku decides it's fitting since Android 8 is too hard to say. Upon reaching the flight of stairs, number 8 explains that the 5th floor secret room lies beyond the brick wall, but even he's unaware of its contents. Beyond the stairs is the 6th floor control room where the village's mayor is being kept, and the two reach the top of the steps. Bursting through the door, Goku demands the release of the mayor. General White congratulates Goku, but refuses to yield, wishing that he'd joined his army as he'd be an amazing asset. Number 8 tells White to stop committing evil acts and to surrender, but White presses a button, causing Goku and Number 8 to fall through a trap door. Goku lands gracefully on his feet, with Number 8 subsequently falling on top of him. Realizing they're now in a mysterious room on the 5th floor, White peers down from the trap door, mocking them. White then proposes a deal. He demands Goku to surrender the Dragon Ball and Radar in order to escape. But Goku adamantly refuses, prompting the trap door to close. White declares his intention to witness their demise through the monitor, and Goku wonders what's in store for them. Number 8 queries Goku about his motives in gathering the Dragon Balls, and Goku explains his quest is for his grandpa's memento, earning Number 8's approval. Suddenly, a section of the room opens, unveiling a massive, drooling, blob-like monster known as Booyan. White announces Booyan's intent to devour the two, instilling fear in Number 8. Goku, however, remains confident it, believing he can defeat Booyan in a single hit, but White asserts Booyan's invincibility, stating no matter what he does, the monster can't be beaten. Booyan attempts to strike Goku with his colossal tail, but Goku evades, launching himself off the wall for a punch to Booyan's face. However, Booyan's rubbery composition causes Goku's fist to bounce off as he lands back on the floor. Undeterred, Goku attempts a kick only to bounce off Booyan's stomach and collide with the wall. Perplexed by Booyan's resilience, Goku notes his attacks aren't working, and Booyan emits an electric beam from his antenna, zapping Goku. Booyan then extends his tongue, wraps Goku in it, and devours him whole. General White revels in his presumed victory, but suddenly, Goku lifts Booyan's mouth open and emerges, stating that if he'd been in there a moment longer, he'd have been digested. Booyan then unleashes his electric beam again, but Goku manages to evade, exclaiming that that move won't work on him twice. Number 8 notes that Goku looks tired, and the boy confirms, stating he's hungry as well. Goku then decides to try a Kamehameha, assuming he can end the battle quickly, but says he'll be exhausting more of his energy. Goku then unleashes the blast, but the energy wave rebounds off Booyan's stomach, leaving Goku in a state of bewilderment. In a state of concern, Goku faces another offer from White, who gives him a chance to surrender the Dragon Ball and Radar. Undeterred, Goku persists in his refusal, exclaiming he'd rather die than hand them over. White commands Booyan to kill Goku in number 8, prompting Booyan to extend his tongue once more, 
Corrin, this time ensnaring number eight. Acting swiftly, Goku intervenes with a kick, freeing Aider just in the nick of time. Goku attempts a direct headbutt at Booyan, only to be repelled and slammed face first into the wall again. Reeling, Goku holds his face, while number eight tells him there's nothing they can do. However, Goku tells him not to be such a coward, as men aren't allowed to give up. Faced with a dilemma, Goku wonders how he can defeat Booyan, and suddenly recalls a lesson from the red-haired village girl about what it means to be frozen solid. Confident in his strategy, Goku declares he'll win this fight, much to everyone's surprise. Goku then punches a hole into the wall, allowing the cold weather of the north to rush in. Shivering, Goku questions if number eight can withstand the cold, and learning he can, seeks refuge in his jacket. The freezing temperatures engulf Booyan, and Goku and number eight witness as the monster is frozen solid. Goku emerges from Aider's jacket and kicks the frozen monster, then retreats back as Booyan begins to shatter. The monster then breaks completely, much to the surprise of number eight and General White. Goku then leaps out of the jacket, propelling himself through the ceiling and onto the sixth floor. White, shocked at what he's seeing, witnesses Goku's unexpected triumph. To facilitate number eight's ascent, Goku extends his power pole down the hole he created and retracts it to pull the android up. In another attempt to thwart Goku, White fires a revolver at him, scoring direct hits. Unfazed, Goku expresses the pain to White, who anxiously wonders how Goku survived his gunshots. Goku then finishes bringing number eight to the sixth floor and demands the return of the village mayor. Goku then watches as White, determined, removes his sweater and readies himself for a confrontation. White puts his guards up and swings at Goku, who effortlessly ducks and delivers a light kick to White's shin, causing noticeable discomfort. Employing a classic diversion tactic, White distracts Goku and delivers a punch to his gut, but the maneuver fails as the attack didn't hurt Goku at all. Goku turns the tables with a powerful punch, sending White bouncing off the ceiling and landing behind his control desk. However, spotting his powered gun, White grins with sinister intent. Conceding defeat, White says he'll hand over the village mayor. He leads Goku and number eight to a hidden room where he opens the door and tells the mayor that there are people here who came to save him. The mayor inquires if the person in question is Goku and Goku reassures the mayor that he and number eight have come to rescue him. He asserts that they've defeated White and his associates, but suddenly White re-emerges, brandishing his powered gun and aiming it at the mayor's head. Goku condemns the dirty tactic, but White revels in Goku's predicament. Suddenly, the mayor boldly expresses his willingness to sacrifice himself for the greater good, urging Goku to defeat White and bring peace to the village. Determined, Goku agrees, but the mayor adds a hopeful request for his own rescue. Instructing Goku to turn around so he doesn't kill the mayor, White seizes the opportunity and fires the powered gun to the back of Goku's head, rendering him unconscious. Number eight's anguished scream echoes as White, gleeful, prepares for the finishing shot. However, the android intervenes, absorbing the shot unharmed. Fueled by rage, number eight abandons his anti-violent stance and delivers a powerful punch to General White, sending him hurtling through the tower and into the distant mountains. Number eight retrieves Goku, who, though sore, is alive due to his supernatural nature. The trio descend to the base of the tower, with Goku praising number eight's strength. Emerging into the snowy landscape, Goku mentions his hunger and the trio share laughter as they make their way back to the village. Night falls on Jingle Village and everyone gathers for a a meal at the residence of the red-haired girl. Goku, with his characteristic appetite, devours everything in sight. The girl's father is now present, expressing gratitude to Goku and number eight for their deeds, alongside the mayor. The Dragon Ball becomes a topic of discussion when the girl's mother mentions it. The father reveals that they never found it and wonders about its whereabouts. Number eight then surprises everyone by pulling out the two-star ball from his pocket, explaining that he found it outside one day, but kept it hidden, as General White would have killed everyone in the village upon its discovery. A look of shock falls upon the village people, and the mayor, expressing his fondness of number eight, extends his invitation for him to live in his house. Although number eight is apprehensive due to being an android, the mayor emphasizes that good and bad are universal qualities, regardless of one's nature. Overwhelmed with emotion, number eight tearfully expresses his happiness and agrees to live with the mayor. He then questions Goku on if he'll live with them as well. Goku, however, declines, stating that this particular Dragon Ball isn't his grandpa's memento and that he'll need to continue his journey journey to find it. Despite number eight's concerns about loneliness, Goku reassures him that they'll meet again someday. The girl's mother suggests that the boy stay overnight, and the mayor decides that number eight will start living with him the next day, after he's had the chance to say goodbye to Goku. The kids and android, now in the girl's room, prepare to sleep. Goku offers one of the Dragon Balls to the girl as a gift, but she declines, fearing the return of the Red Ribbon Army. Goku
Goku decides to keep them in his sack with the Dragon Radar, and when Number 8 expresses interest about the tool, Goku plays around with it and realizes it's broken, likely due to his battles with the Red Ribbon Army. Number 8 offers to fix the radar himself, but upon inspection, he states the technology is too complicated, and notes whoever made it must be a genius. Goku then contemplates visiting Bulma's house for repairs, as he can't search for the Dragon Balls without it. Goku recalls Bulma living in West City, but is unsure of the direction. The girl points to where she thinks it may be, and Number 8 comments on the considerable distance to West City. Despite the challenge, Goku decides to walk, surprising everyone, though they wish him luck. As the group sleep for the night, Number 8 smiles, finding the futon comfortable. The next morning arrives, and Goku, once again bundled in winter clothes, is bid farewell by the villagers. Surprised by Goku's decision to walk, Goku explains that his flying Nimbus was destroyed, and an old man questions if he could really ride one. Goku, astonished, inquires how the old man knows about Master Roshi Nimbus, and the old man explains they used to be around when he was a kid, but as time went on, those pure of heart gradually disappeared, making the Nimbus scarce. The old man suggests calling the flying Nimbus and says they can't be destroyed, prompting Goku to try. Just as the man said, Nimbus promptly arrives, and Goku joyfully embraces it. After bidding farewell to everyone, Goku zooms off toward West City as everyone waves goodbye. Not long after, Goku and Nimbus make their way out of the north as Goku cheerfully eats and continues toward Bulma. Goku arrives in West City, marveling at his vastness and bustling activity. Disembarking from the flying Nimbus, he begins his exploration. In the midst of traffic, a car driver chastises Goku, who inquires about Bulma's house. Uninterested though, the driver speeds away. Goku then approaches a lady with a baby carriage, seeking directions to Bulma's house. However, she's equally clueless and advises him to ask someone else. Perplexed that a fellow city dweller doesn't know, Goku flags down a taxi and hops in. Driving along, Goku tells the driver that he's really nice for taking him and says he wants to get to Bulma's house. When Goku admits he doesn't know the address though, the driver stops abruptly, questioning if Goku has any money. Lacking funds, Goku is ejected onto the street, realizing that navigating the city requires money. Observing a crowd nearby, Goku discovers a boxer, challenging people to defeat him for a 100,000 zenny prize. Determined to participate, Goku's eagerness surprises the boxer, as everyone laughs, assuming this to be a joke. However, the boxer concedes, telling Goku he won't even charge him to compete. As a result, Goku tells the boxer he'll go easy on him, and the crowd continues to laugh. As the two get started, Goku lands a punch to the boxer's stomach, much to the surprise of the crowd. Goku tells him to give up, but recognizing Goku's martial arts skills, the boxer opts to intensify his efforts. Goku then jumps up and kicks the boxer in his chin, much to everyone's shock. The boxer attempts a few more strikes toward Goku, but is unsuccessful, leading the boy to jump into the air and kick the brick wall next to the boxer head, smashing it to pieces. Realizing Goku's strength, the boxer gives up, and Goku earns the prize money. Shortly after, Goku continues to traverse the city streets, contemplating on who would know Bulma's whereabouts. In an alley, two thugs spot Goku standing alone, and decide to relieve him of his newfound wealth. Inviting Goku into the alley, one of the criminals brandishes a gun, and demands the money in Goku's hands. Unfazed, Goku wonders if they'll reveal Bulma's house location, but all they care about is the money. Goku refuses to give it to them, and annoyed, the thug with a knife screams at him. However, Goku effortlessly headbutts him and knocks him out. The remaining thug, recognizing this kid isn't someone to be messed with, suggests asking a policeman for directions. Approaching a girl for directions to a policeman, Goku hands her his money in gratitude and skips away. He then approaches a policeman, questioning Bulma's whereabouts, and sketches an awful drawing of her as a reference. The policeman, unable to find Bulma based on the drawing, decides to use his computer. After a brief search, he identifies Bulma as the daughter of the Capsule Corporation owner, and given the distance, offers Goku a ride on his motor scooter. The two arrive at Capsule Corps, and excitedly, Goku yells out to Bulma, wondering where she is. Rather than yelling, the policeman suggests trying the intercom, but Goku is unfamiliar with it. The officer contacts Capsule Corporation and inquires about Bulma, but a voice answers and says she's currently in school. The officer remembers that school hasn't ended yet, and questions Goku on what he'll do now. Goku decides to wait, assuring the officer that he can leave. However, the officer insists on staying to verify Goku's identity, finding it challenging to believe someone like him would know the daughter of Capsule Corporation's owner. Suddenly, Goku claims to smell Bulma approaching, and she arrives on a futuristic motor scooter. Goku greets Bulma, and happy to see him, Bulma praises Goku for finding her house, and thanks the police. Bulma wonders what made Goku visit, and Goku explains that he needs her help fixing the broken radar she gave him. Bulma invites him inside, and the policeman requests to have his scooter fixed as well. The three 
head in, and a robot greets the trio, telling Bulma that her father is in the garden. Unlocking a massive door nearby, the trio enter the garden, Bulma commanding a robot nearby to locate her father, as Goku and the policemen marvel at the animals running around. Soon after, Bulma's father, Dr. Brief, enters on a bicycle with a black cat on his shoulder. Initially mistaking the policemen for Goku, Dr. Brief greets Goku, leaving the officer surprised that the creator of Capsule Core is so informal. Bulma suggests she and Goku go upstairs, and Dr. Brief questions if they're gonna make out, prompting embarrassment on Bulma's part. The two take off as Goku wonders what a kiss is, leaving Bulma's father to fix the policeman's scooter. Meanwhile, at the Red Ribbon Army headquarters, Commander Red and his assistant receive intel on Goku's whereabouts in West City, and extract a photo of what he looks like. Realizing he really is nothing more than just a boy, Commander Red boils in anger. Red then orders the image to be distributed to all Red Ribbon units, instructing his soldiers to find and eliminate Goku. At the same time, Bulma finishes repairing the Dragon Radar, and notices that Goku has found only two Dragon Balls so far. She proposes accompanying Goku on his quest, but he thinks she'll just get in the way. Goku notes that Bulma can't even ride on the flying Nimbus, and wonders how she'll travel with him. In response, Bulma shows Goku her Micro Band, a watch that can shrink her to mouse size. She demonstrates its abilities and shrinks, surprising Goku as Bulma tells him he'll be able to carry her around. Just then, a woman in heels accidentally steps on Bulma. It's revealed to be the girl's mother, who cheerfully greets Goku. Bulma then grows back to normal size, and berates her mother for stepping on her. Bulma's mom offers Goku alcohol, but Bulma scolds her for offering that to a kid. Goku then changes the subject and inquires about Yamcha and Oolong, which appears to trigger Bulma. Bulma's mother then goes on a tangent, stating how Yamcha and the others are in school. She goes on to say that Bulma and Yamcha are currently at odds, as Yamcha's getting more popular with the women, and Bulma doesn't like it. Bulma, in dispute with Yamcha, claims she's going with Goku to look for the Dragon Balls again, and this time, she'll find a much better man than Yamcha. Bulma's mom suggests joining the quest for a good man, too, but Bulma dismisses the idea. Goku and Bulma head downstairs, where Dr. Brief works on the policeman's scooter. Bulma tells her father about their plan to search for the Dragon Balls again, and grabs a case of capsules on his desk to take with her. Dr. Brief playfully advises Bulma to find him a lovely gal on their journey, but Bulma expresses her annoyance. Outside, Bulma points Goku in the direction of the next Dragon Ball, and Goku calls on the flying Nimbus, surprising the officer. Bulma shrinks down, hops into Goku's shirt, and they take off, Bulma completely unaware of Goku's run-ins with the Red Ribbon Army. Goku and Bulma continue their journey on the flying Nimbus, Goku hoping the four-star ball is the next Dragon Ball they find. Meanwhile, at Red Ribbon headquarters, Commander Red's assistant informs Red that Goku is headed toward the Dragon Ball in General Blue's jurisdiction. Angrily, Red orders one of his soldiers to contact General Blue about the situation, and tell him to use all his powers to kill Goku at once. At General Blue's temporary camp, Blue berates his troops for being unable to find another Dragon Ball. When informed that the Dragon Ball is at the bottom of the ocean, Blue dismisses any excuses. Suddenly, Blue notices a guy picking his nose, and demands he be sentenced to death at once. As the guy is being killed, a soldier reports that the kid they've heard about is headed their way. Blue, finding this news amusing, is reminded by another soldier that this kid defeated Colonel Silver and General White. However, General Blue is undeterred, as he glances at Goku's photo and notes that things are about to get interesting. Meanwhile, Bulma urges Goku to stop, revealing that the Dragon Ball is directly below them in the ocean, and suggests going to a nearby island to find a boat. When the two land, Goku plans to swim to find it, prompting Bulma to retrieve her capsule case. To her surprise though, she discovers that she took her dad's case instead, containing only one capsule. Goku wonders what's inside the capsule, but Bulma says she's unsure, and has a bad feeling about opening it. However, Goku suggests whatever it is may come in handy, and Bulma, having faith in her father, tosses it into the distance. To Bulma's surprise though, the capsule is unveiled to be a collection of adult magazines. Goku finds it strange that people are naked when they're not bathing, and Bulma scolds him while tearing up the magazines. Goku decides to dive into the water and search instead, stripping down and using the flying Nimbus to fly to an area above the ocean. Goku dives in, and after swimming until he can no longer hold his breath, Goku returns to the surface and flies back to the island only to find Bulma missing. Bulma, seeking a place to buy capsules, encounters two jet flyers. As she tries to flag them down, the two suddenly open fire on her, and she becomes their target. However, one of the pilots soon realizes that this isn't the kid they're looking for, and they land to speak to Bulma. Bulma questions the two about a place to buy capsules, but they inform her that this island was once deserted, so there aren't any capsules to buy. The two then tell Bulma
Roma that she's cute and suggest doing something fun with them, implying something inappropriate. Realizing what this means, Bulma runs off as they fly after her, and Goku hears her screams. Flying past the jet flyers on Nimbus, Goku questions if these are bad guys. Bulma confirms this, and suddenly, one of the men notice that this is the boy they've been looking for. When the two begin to fire at Goku, Goku decides to fight back. He jumps through the windshield of one of the jet flyers, causing it to fall, and then cuts the second one in half with his power pole as the two aircrafts crash below. Bulma is astonished, and suddenly, Goku suggests going to Master Roshi's house nearby, believing he might have a capsule for underwater travel. Although Bulma isn't thrilled about seeing Roshi again, Goku assures her that it's a good plan. Goku and Bulma continue their journey on Nimbus until they reach Kame House. Landing, Goku greets the turtle, and the turtle calls for Master Roshi outside, announcing Goku's arrival. Master Roshi appears and greets Goku, inquiring about his hunt for the four-star ball, although Goku explains he hasn't found it yet. Goku prompts Bulma to explain the situation, as she exits his shirt and returns to normal size, shocking Master Roshi and the turtle. Intrigued by her transformation, Roshi questions how she did it. Bulma then introduces the micro band she invented and gets straight to the point, asking Master Roshi for a submarine capsule they can borrow. Goku explains that the Dragon Ball is at the bottom of the ocean and it's too deep to dive down. Master Roshi agrees to lend it to them, but Bulma is concerned that it was too easy. Roshi then adds a condition, stating they must give him the shrinking tech in return. Relieved that Roshi didn't ask for something perverted this time, Bulma gladly hands over the micro band, asking for the submarine capsule. However, Roshi reveals that Krillin and Launch took it out for shopping, but will be back soon. At the Red Ribbon headquarters, Commander Red wonders why the boy has stopped moving suddenly. Red's assistants suggest that the kid might have allies, possibly an exceptional scientist who invented the superior dragon radar. Agreeing, Red deduces that the place he stopped at must be their base. He then instructs his assistant to contact General Blue to scout the area and find the enemy's hideout. Soon after, Blue receives the orders at his temporary camp. Meanwhile, while waiting for Krillin and launch, Bulma tells the turtle that she's going to use the bathroom. Hearing these words, Master Roshi seizes the opportunity, claiming he's going to watch TV, but uses the micro band to shrink and sneak under the bathroom door. Inside, he encounters Bulma, who appears to be handling her business. Roshi climbs atop the toilet to get a better view, but is caught by surprise as Bulma has already finished. Upset, he accidentally falls into the toilet and gets flushed, confusing Bulma as she thought she heard something. Back outside, Roshi emerges from the sewage pipes and grows back to normal size, smelling horrible as he's questioned by the turtle on why he isn't watching TV. Suddenly, Goku spots Krillin and Launch returning in an aircraft. The two land and exchange greetings, with Bulma noting how nice the technology is. Bulma corrects Krillin when he refers to her as panties, and Krillin expresses his delay with Launch due to the latter's transformation in town, as she caused an uproar. At the same time, a red ribbon scouting jet hovers over the nearby islands, informing General Blue that there's currently no sign of any suspicious structures. Back at Kame House, Krillin, now filled in on the submarine situation, mentions Goku and Bulma could also find some pirate's treasure around the ocean as well. Intrigued by the mention of treasure, Bulma, Goku, and Krillin decide to explore together. Master Roshi approves of Krillin tagging along, and the trio take off into the air. As they venture forward, Goku notes that they're supposed to be swimming, not flying, but Bulma states that this capsule plane serves as a submarine as well. Bulma then realizes that she left the bag of Dragon Balls behind, but Krillin assures her they'll be fine with Master Roshi. The jet flyer from General Blue's team then spots an aircraft and decides to do some recon, stumbling across Kame House from above. The pilot reports back to General Blue, who tells the pilot to check to see if anyone is actually on the island. The pilot then identifies Master Roshi, Launch, and the Turtle, and General Blue deduces that Roshi must be the one who created the Dragon Radar. Flying toward their destination, Bulma monitors the radar while Krillin pilots their craft, as he's instructed to dive at a specific location. General Blue, observing them through binoculars from the shore, confirms that the boy is leading a party of three to the depths of the ocean. A nearby soldier relays information through the radio, informing Blue that the enemy's two Dragon Balls are still on the island. Blue deduces that it must be the enemy's base, and decides to split his squad into two. He decides to lead Troop A, planning to pursue Goku and the others, while Troop B, led by an officer, is tasked with attacking the enemy's base. Underwater, Bulma locates the Dragon Ball right below them, but the ocean floor appears barren. Goku volunteers to investigate and is outfitted with scuba gear, wondering if it will actually allow him to breathe underwater. While Goku explores, he still doesn't see the Dragon Ball, but discovers a deep crack assuming it must have fallen in there. Opting to see how deep the crack really is, Bulma and Krillin dive further into the ocean, with Bulma realizing that the dragon
Dragon Ball is likely located in a deep crevice. Goku wishes they had the shrinking tech that Bulma gave to Master Roshi, but Bulma checks the radar again, discovering that the cave system continues and has an entry point nearby. Meanwhile, the officer leading Troop B and a dozen jet flyers approach Kame House. At the same time, General Blue commands Troop A from a large military submarine, which has closed in on Goku's sub. A hippo crew member questions Blue if they should attack, but Blue opts to wait until the group locate the Dragon Ball. As Bulma and the others find the cave's entrance, Blue orders an attack, firing torpedoes. The torpedoes miss and crash alongside the cave's entrance, alerting Goku and the others. Krillin and Bulma wonder what's going on, and Goku suspects the Red Ribbon Army's involvement. Bulma and Krillin then panic, knowing the army's infamous reputation. Goku reveals that they're also seeking the Dragon Balls and are hunting Goku as he's been getting in their way. Krillin labels the Red Ribbon Army the most evil army in the world, and the three enter the cave to escape more incoming torpedoes. General Blue changes tactics, ordering the pursuit of Goku and the execution of the gunmen as they fail to take out the enemy ship. Goku and the others are pursued by the Red Ribbon sub, and Bulma berates Goku for failing to mention his involvement with the army. Krillin celebrates as the group navigate through the cave, spotting a smaller hole ahead which will halt the Red Ribbon submarine. However, General Blue orders his men to prepare their mini sub and he's joined by a few others as he pursues the trio. Meanwhile at Kame House, the turtle notices something flying their way and Troop B lands on the beach, determined to capture Master Roshi. Master Roshi questions the presence of the intruders on his island and the leading officer praises him as the inventor of the Dragon Radar, addressing him as the scientist. Confused, Roshi wonders what's going on and questions who these people are. The officer reveals that they're from the Red Ribbon Army and Roshi notes he's heard of them before as they're known for their evil deeds and aversion to justice. A soldier then emerges from the house holding launch at gunpoint and Master Roshi inquires about their motive. The officer explains that they tracked the two Dragon Balls Goku had at this location and want Master Roshi to make them a radar that's even more advanced than the one Goku has in his possession. Roshi questions launch on if there are any more Dragon Balls in the house and she suggests they might be inside as one of the kids left a bag when they took off. Roshi wonders what the army intends to wish for with the Dragon Balls but they refuse to answer. Roshi then inquires what they'll do if he refuses to help them and the leading officer declares they'll kill him. Having made up his mind, Master Roshi declares to just fight them all, much to the officer's surprise. Roshi delivers a powerful punch to the officer's gut, kicks another in the face, and strikes another with his staff. Skillfully, Master Roshi jumps and simultaneously kicks two soldiers, then maneuvers between two others, delivering a stomach kick and an elbow strike. Leaping up, he elbows another soldier on the back of the neck. A remaining soldier fires a machine gun at the old man, but he effortlessly catches all the bullets and drops them as he retaliates with a kick. Only one soldier remains, holding Launch hostage. Threatening the killer, the soldier is interrupted by the turtle using a tree branch to tickle Launch's nose. Launch sneezes, revealing her aggressive form, and infuriated, she breaks free, delivering an uppercut that puts the soldier on his back. Launch then proceeds to swear as she kicks the soldier repeatedly, spitting on his unconscious body as Master Roshi pulls her off of him. As things quiet down, Roshi notices another soldier who was hiding and attempting to escape. He requests him to remove his unconscious comrades, stating that he doesn't want this trash sitting on his lawn. Meanwhile, General Blue leads Red Ribbon Troop A in pursuit of Goku and his companions, and Bulma realizes they switched over to a mini submarine of their own. A soldier suggests firing a torpedo, but Blue fears it might cause a cave-in and tells him to wait. As Blue's troops continue the chase, Goku and the others resurface. Krillin, initially thinking they're outside, is corrected by Bulma, and the trio get out of the sub and start running again. Blue's two submarines surface as well, and as the troops rush out to chase them, a soldier informs Blue that Troop B has been wiped out. At the same time, Goku stops, questioning the need to run as he believes he can just defeat the army. Krillin argues they have guns, but Goku says they'll just have to dodge the bullets. The soldiers are called back as the situation has changed, and General Blue acknowledges that this is no ordinary enemy. One soldier underestimates the threat, noting they're all kids, but Blue emphasizes that the boy wiped out Colonel Silver and General White's forces. He goes on to say that Troop B was also wiped out by an old man and a woman, prompting surprise from the other soldiers. Soon after, Goku notices that the chase has stopped, and despite the odds, General Blue confidently asserts his ability to handle Goku and the others himself. Pressing forward, the cave has become dark, and Goku wonders if they'll be able to find the Dragon Ball. Bulma playfully suggests that Krillin, with his bright bald head, should lead the way, and Goku manages to find a button on a wall, which acts as a light switch. Surprised by the existence of electricity down here, Bulma speculates they must not have been the 
first ones to enter this cave. Nearby, General Blue and his troops also observe this, and Blue speculates the possibility of this cave being some sort of secret base. As Bulma continues to ponder the situation, Goku gets her attention, playfully startling her by wearing a skull on his head, prompting Blue to order a soldier to investigate the scream. Goku removes the skull and laughs hysterically, causing Bulma to scold him, and Krillin questions where he found it. Goku points to a pirate skeleton, sparking excitement in Krillin as he knows what this place is. Krillin explains that this is a cave where pirates hid their treasure long ago, and he and Bulma cheer at the prospect of finding it. Nearby, the soldier General Blue sent listens in and radios him about the discovery, leaving him delighted as they'll soon not only possess the Dragon Ball, but loads of treasure. As they proceed, the trio encounter a peculiar hallway with dots on the floor and holes in the walls. Krillin, dismissing it as nothing, steps forward, triggering a trap where a spear shoots just above his head. Bulma identifies it as a trap set to protect the treasure and realizes the buttons on the floor trigger it. Goku jokes that Krillin's short stature saved him and Krillin retorts that Goku is short too. Goku then suggests not touching the floor, but Bulma wonders how they'll do that, deeming it impossible to get across. However, Goku offers to jump and leaps to the end of the hallway, surprising Bulma. Krillin, remembering he can do the same after Master Roshi's training, dismisses Bulma's warnings to jump across and leaps, same as Goku. However, he goes a bit too high as he hits the ceiling and barely manages to reach the end of the hallway, landing on the few holes left on the floor as spears shoot out and hit the wall. Goku urges Bulma to jump as she's the last one left, but she protests, unable to do so. Meanwhile, General Blue and his men catch up to the soldier watching Goku and the others, who reports that they're unarmed and wandering around. Blue smirks at the turn of events, assuming that they were in a hurry and left their weapons behind on their submarine. Blue deduces that these weapons must have been the reason the group were so strong, and believes that without them, Goku and the others are nothing but kids, and declares victory. At the same time, Bulma hangs over the power pole while Goku slowly retracts it to create a makeshift bridge for her to cross. Having arrived safely, the trio proceed as General Blue instructs his troops to advance with the intention to kill. As Blue contemplates obtaining the Dragon Balls and the treasure, he hears screams in the distance and rushes ahead to see what's wrong. When he arrives, Blue finds all of his men dead in the trap-filled hallway. One surviving soldier apologizes for their unintended demise, and Blue realizes that the pirates must have had a way to bypass the traps. He finds a switch hidden behind a rock on a wall, opening a door, and elsewhere, Goku, Krillin, and Bulma discover the pirates' code. The harbor sprawls expansively with a large dock housing a colossal ship, a building, and parked cars. Bulma speculates that this must have been the pirate's base, and Krillin believes the treasure is concealed somewhere within. Engaging in further conversation about the harbor, General Blue observes the group, noting he'll eliminate them after they find the treasure for him. Goku senses something, startling Blue, but Goku assures Krillin that it's not the Red Ribbon Army, as it lacks a human presence. Suddenly, a skeleton emerges from the building, armed with a gun for its left arm and a sword for its right hand. Swinging the sword at the group, Goku and Krillin jump out of the way, with Goku saving Bulma from being slashed. While Bulma believes this adversary to be a ghost, Krillin identifies it as a robot. Evading the robot's bullets, Goku charges at it, delivering a powerful kick to the back of its head. Krillin follows up by chopping off the sword's blade with his hand, and Goku delivers a punch to the robot's torso. Blue takes note of their martial arts skills, and the robot retaliates, punching Krillin in the face and sending him back. Acknowledging their enemy's strength, Goku and Krillin prepare for another assault as Bulma watches. As the robot continues to shoot at them, Goku instructs Krillin to find the Dragon Ball with Bulma while he handles their enemy. Goku executes a jump kick, propelling the robot into the water, providing Krillin and Bulma the chance to escape. Unbeknownst to them, General Blue discreetly follows behind. Goku peers into the water, wondering if the robot was defeated, but the robot's tail ensnares him, dragging Goku down and electrocuting him. Breaking free, Goku leaps onto the surface, catching his breath. Before the robot comes up as well, Goku decides to use the power pole to reach the roof of a nearby building. The robot then emerges from the water, scanning its surroundings. Goku leaps from the building and descends straight at it, punching through the robot with intense force and triggering an explosion. Reveling in his victory, Goku rushes to catch up with the others. Meanwhile, Krillin notices the explosion, which causes the foundation of the cove to crack. He and Bulma sprint away, reaching a fork in their path.
that. Bulma proposes to find a way to let Goku know where they're going, and Krillin marks their chosen direction with the debris from the ceiling. When Blue catches up, he erases the arrow and indicates a different path, aiming to confuse Goku. Spotting the modified arrow, Goku adjusts his course, heading left instead of right. Choosing the left path, Goku proceeds while Blue laughs, persistently pursuing the others to the right. Running through the cove, Krillin and Bulma reach a dead end, featuring only a hole filled with water. Stripping down to their undergarments respectively, the two dive in and traverse the underwater cave. Shortly after, Blue catches up, shedding his shirt and hat as he prepares to dive as well, expressing uncertainty about the cleanliness of the water. Meanwhile, Goku also encounters a dead end, but falls through a trap door, fortuitously landing on an octopus who claims this is his first catch in a long time. Leaping onto a rock, Goku identifies the creature as a squid, agitating the octopus. Goku realizes he needs to depart, but the octopus, craving something delicious, seizes him with a tentacle. Smashing Goku against the rocks in an attempt to dispatch him, Goku sits dizzy and injured as the octopus prepares to eat him. However, Goku proposes offering something truly delectable, prompting him to blast the octopus in the face with a Kamehameha. In a submerged room, Bulma and Krillin emerge from the water and discover a treasure chest upon surfacing. Excitedly, they open it, revealing the trove of treasure, much to their surprise. Their joy is short-lived though as General Blue surfaces, declaring the Red Ribbon Army's intent to claim the treasure. Bulma, initially startled but finding Blue attractive, attempts to flirt with him, but Blue moves away, repulsed by Bulma's advances. Krillin and Bulma, misunderstanding his reaction, presume he's gay, and Blue warns them against making such assumptions, but Krillin remains unfazed. Meanwhile, Goku eats the now fried octopus, satiating his hunger. Hearing a scream nearby, he wonders if it's Bulma and Krillin, and Krillin, battered, confronts Blue, who wonders if that's really all he's got. Krillin opts to get serious and jumps toward Blue, but Krillin takes a forceful punch to the face, prompting screams from Bulma. Recognizing Bulma's scream, Goku dives into the water, swimming toward their location. Krillin, astonished by Blue's strength, slowly rises to his feet. Despite Blue's disbelief that Krillin still wants to fight, Bulma encourages him. Krillin charges at Blue, leaving an after image on the ground, and descends with a kick to Blue's face. Krillin taunts Blue, but the general is more concerned with his face, surprised that Krillin actually managed to damage it. Blue then looks down and notices blood dripping from his nose, horrified by the damage done to a high-ranking officer of the Red Ribbon Army. Now wearing nose plugs, Blue expresses disgust and directs his attention toward Krillin. Activating his psychic abilities, Blue immobilizes Krillin, alarming Bulma as the general apparently has special powers. Blue, threatening Krillin's life, kicks him into the air and follows up with a punch that sends him crashing into a wall, leaving Bulma anxious about her impending fate. As Blue contemplates the collapsing environment and rush to get the Dragon Balls, Bulma decides to employ her special seduction strategy to distract him. She flirts with Blue, wiggling her body, provoking the general's frustration as he finds Bulma repulsive. Remembering Blue must be gay, Bulma claims to be a man, but Blue refuses it, citing her substantial breasts. Fleeing from Blue's threats, Bulma leaves him holding a massive rock, poised to deliver the final blow to Krillin. As Blue rushes in, suddenly, Goku emerges from the water, prompting Blue to halt his actions. Happy to see her companion, Bulma implores Goku to defeat the Red Ribbon operative who harmed them, and Goku vows to retaliate for Krillin's defeat. The two confront each other, and Goku dodges Blue's punch, retaliating with a punch of his own to the gut. Blue attempts a sweep kick, but Goku effortlessly leaps over it. Utilizing the cave wall, Goku knees Blue in the back of the head, leaving the general reeling as Goku states he's no match for him. Krillin notes Goku's enhanced strength since the Tenkaichi Budokai, and growing increasingly furious, Blue rises and tells Goku that he'll never forgive him. Bulma attempts to warn Goku about Blue's psychic powers, but Blue ensnares the boy before he can move, moving toward Goku to finish him. Bulma and Krillin express concern, while Blue prepares to finish Goku. Blue delivers a devastating kick to the boy, sending him bouncing off the ceiling and crashing to the ground. As the cave continues to collapse, Blue hastily decides to retrieve the treasure and the Dragon Balls. Drawing a capsule, he produces a shotgun and threatens to shoot Goku unless Bulma discloses the Dragon Ball's location. Nervously, Bulma points to the pond nearby, prompting Blue to express gratitude and he vows to kill Goku and the others anyway. Fearing for her safety after Goku's demise, Bulma cries while Krillin says she talks too much. With the shotgun pointed at Goku, Blue bids him a fair well until a mouse runs by. Horrified, Blue drops the gun
gun, losing concentration, and Goku is able to move again. Charging in and using his rock, scissors, paper technique, Goku pokes Blue's eyes and delivers a powerful punch that sends him crashing into a wall, incapacitating him. Krillin and Bulma cheer, but despite their victory, the cave's imminent collapse prompts urgency. Bulma urges everyone to forget about the Dragon Ball, but Goku instructs his friends to flee as he searches in the pond nearby. Goku dives in, and the two take off as Goku hastily searches for the ball. Goku moves a rock aside to uncover the three-star ball, safely secures it in his shirt, and swims to the surface. Emerging, Goku appears to search for something else as he notices the mouse that saved his life and puts it in his mouth for safety from the crumbling cave. Bulma and Krillin, racing through the crumbling harbor, find their exit blocked by fallen rocks, leading them to consider using a nearby submarine. Meanwhile, General Blue regains consciousness, attempting to steal the treasure chest at the very least, but is crushed as the ceiling collapses. Bulma and Krillin manage to start the submarine's engine but wait for Goku, who's sprinting back with the three-star ball in his shirt and the mouse in his mouth. The harbor continues to crumble, prompting Bulma to suggest leaving. However, Krillin hesitates, unwilling to abandon Goku. Bulma emphatically asserts that her own life is of utmost importance, and Krillin reluctantly agrees, the two convinced that Goku wouldn't die in a place like this anyway. As the two prepare to dive, Krillin spots Goku approaching and tells Bulma to wait. Despite a rock hitting him on the head, Goku continues and his friends flag him down as he almost runs past the submarine. Everyone aboard, the sub submerges amidst the fallen rocks. Goku retrieves the mouse from his mouth, relieved that it's unharmed. However, the water becomes more cluttered with rocks and Krillin warns of the cave's impending collapse. The group reach a nearby tunnel and although Bulma shares initial excitement about being able to escape, it's short-lived as the tunnel begins to collapse as well. To make matters worse, the submarine suddenly stops as Bulma tells the others that it's run out of fuel. Krillin and Bulma panic in the face of death but Goku, resolute in saving the life of a mouse, tells Krillin to hold him and warns everyone to hold their breath. In a bold move, Goku performs the Kamehameha, surprising Bulma. As the boy unleashes the blast, the glass covering the sub is blown off, propelling the submarine from the collapsing cave tunnel to the ocean's surface. As the trio emerge from the ocean, in midair, Goku summons the flying Nimbus, grabbing Krillin's foot, who in return holds Bulma's arm and the mouse. The group joyfully soar in their unconventional formation, while at the same time, General Blue's head emerges from the water. Relieved, they sit on a shore near Blue's base. Though Krillin is disappointed about missing the treasure, Bulma surprises him by reaching into her panties and revealing a large diamond from them. Krillin is impressed and puzzled about how she managed to grab it in the ensuing chaos, and says that explains why her special area was bulging a little much for a girl. The diamond reminds Goku that he acquired the Dragon Ball while in the ocean, but he He's disappointed when he discovers it's not his grandfather's four-star memento. Bulma questions if Goku intends to continue the search for the four-star ball, and when Goku confirms, she refuses to risk her life for him again, reminding him that she only came because he failed to mention the Red Ribbon Army's involvement in the first place. Krillin then points out a Red Ribbon helicopter on the island and suggests a return to Master Roshi's house as the three take off. Reaching the shore shortly after, Blue notices the departure of the others and assumes they're headed to their secret base. On their way, Bulma offers the diamond to Krillin and Master Roshi as compensation for their lost submarine, and when Krillin smells it to see if it stinks, Bulma yells at it. Unbeknownst to the group, General Blue follows close behind them in his own helicopter. Back at Kame House, Master Roshi is astounded at receiving the diamond, while Bulma appraises him of its value in the tens of billions of zenny. Roshi muses about the possibilities of having strippers every day, but Krillin urges him not to squander the money, considering the peril they face to obtain it. As Launch, in her aggressive form, watches from behind, the turtle suggests holding on to the diamond to prevent Master Roshi from misusing it, prompting Roshi to reprimand him. Suddenly, Launch brandishes a gun, instructing the group not to move and hand over the diamond quietly. Complying, Master Roshi watches as Launch takes off in the Red Ribbon Plane, much to everyone's shock. Confused, Bulma, who hadn't met Launch beforehand, seeks an explanation as to why nobody is going after her. Krillin and Master Roshi, however, 
however, inform her about Launch's sneeze-induced transformations, and assume she'll be back with a diamond once she sneezes again. Meanwhile, Blue, using binoculars, locates Kame House. Employing a rope, he descends from his helicopter onto the island, landing on his feet and concealing himself behind the house. Goku expresses his intention to search for the next Dragon Ball, and Bulma questions Master Roshi on if he has an airplane for her to use to get home. Lacking one, Roshi proposes she stay as his mistress, leading to Bulma's vehement objections. Goku entrusts Master Roshi with the Dragon Balls, and Roshi, addressing Krillin's concerns about the Red Ribbon Army coming for him, boasts about his capability to handle them himself. Suddenly, General Blue, using his psychic ability, levitates his rope and uses it to telekinetically bind everyone. Revealing himself once again, he revels in his tactics, much to the surprise of Goku and the others, who are surprised he's still alive. Blue then goes into Kame House to find the Dragon Balls, as the group attempt to free themselves from their bind. Krillin implores Master Roshi to intervene, but Roshi states he was caught off guard, unable to sense Blue's presence. Blue then emerges with the bag containing the three Dragon Balls. As a parting gesture, he leaves the group with a bomb set to explode in five minutes, telling them to enjoy the taste of true fear. Extracting a capsule with another jet plane, Blue prepares to depart, dismissing Bulma's nervous request to join the Red Ribbon Army, saying they don't need any women. Master Roshi then volunteers out of fear, but Blue takes off, leaving the group with four minutes left to enjoy life before the bomb detonates. As the group grapple with their constraints and the impending explosion, Launch suddenly makes a return. Now in her good form and questioning why she was riding a helicopter, she's urged by everyone to dispose of the bomb. It's a bit heavy for her, so she contemplates throwing it in the trash, an idea dismissed by Bulma. Goku then tells Launch to undo his ropes, and with only five seconds remaining, she manages to cut him loose. Goku tosses the bomb high into the air, and it detonates shortly after. Goku then calls on the flying Nimbus, taking off to retrieve the Dragon Balls from General Blue. Goku pursues Blue, catching up to him in a different area. Meanwhile, on a mysterious island in Penguin Village, a group of characters from the Dr. Slump manga are making their way home from school. After some interactions between friends and everyone arriving home for summer vacation, the girl Aurelie and her angels known as Gatchan dash home, only to notice the flying Nimbus and Blue's jet soaring through the sky. Goku closely trails Blue, prompting Blue to express the need to shake him off. Blue puts his ship into high gear and blasts further away, but Goku instructs Nimbus to accelerate, surging ahead of Blue. Goku taunts Blue by sticking out his tongue, leaving Blue in shock as he says it shouldn't be possible to keep up with his rocket. Goku, however, states that this is nothing for his Nimbus as he pulls out his power pole. Goku prepares to strike Blue's ship, but Blue executes a U-turn, causing Goku to narrowly miss. Blue decides to cut off his engine as Goku effortlessly catches up, assuming the general to have given up as the two hover over to Aurelia house. However, Blue chuckles at Goku being right behind him and activates his jet rockets once more, blasting Goku in the face and knocking him off the flying Nimbus. As Blue laughs at the outcome, he takes his eyes off of his trajectory and ultimately crashes into a mountain, triggering a gigantic explosion. Nearby, Goku descends to the ground, amused by Blue's crash, and lands unharmed in front of Aureli. She cheerfully greets him and he reciprocates, as Goku calls for the flying Nimbus once more and zooms off after the Dragon Ball. Close behind, Aurelie is in pursuit, telling him to come back and play with her. Meanwhile, it's revealed that General Blue has miraculously survived the crash. Blue clumsily navigates through the mountainous terrain, clutching the bag containing the Dragon Balls. Frustrated with Goku, he spots the young warrior approaching on the flying Nimbus, much to his surprise. Goku, unaware of Blue's presence, spots the wreckage of the jet, while Blue, nearby, decides it would be best to return to Red Ribbon Army HQ for now. He descends from a mountain and lands on his feet, taking off with the Dragon Balls. Arriving at the destroyed jet, Goku searches the wreckage for both the Dragon Balls and Blue's body, suspecting the latter is still alive. Suddenly, Aurelia arrives, and Goku marvels at her speed, stating she's just about as fast as the flying Nimbus. He queries her training, but Aurelia is confused and questions what this means. When questioned why he's there, Goku mentions he's hunting a bad guy and calls Nimbus to get a better vantage point. Meanwhile, General Blue finds a phone booth and contemplates how to return to Red Ribbon headquarters while evading Goku. Spotting a passing car, he flags it down, irritating the driver. Blue, seeking transportation, tells the driver driver to get out of the car, who realizes this is a robbery. The driver then rushes to the phone booth and changes his clothes, transforming into Sour Man, whose powers derive from eating sour plums. Unimpressed, Blue wonders what's going on, and Sour Man exclaims he's going to unveil
unveil his true power. After a moment of silence, General Blue casually walks over to the phone booth, grips it, and smashes it with ease, surprising Sour Man. Now understanding the gravity of the situation, Sour Man is more willing to assist Blue in any way he can. Blue tells Sour Man to hand over any capsules he has, but unaware of such a thing, Sour Man says he doesn't have any. Blue then questions if anyone nearby has an airplane, and Sour Man suggests visiting Sinbi Noramaki as he provides Blue with directions to his house. Meanwhile, Goku, unable to locate Blue, checks the Dragon Radar to find him along with the Dragon Balls, but discovers it's broken again. He says he'll need Bulma to fix it again, but suddenly has a realization and questions where he is. Aureli informs him they're in Penguin Village, and Goku expresses concern about not knowing Master Roshi's location. Aureli proposes visiting their scientist who can fix the Dragon Radar, and she effortlessly hops onto Nimbus as they speed towards the house. Upon their arrival, Aureli enjoyed the ride and introduces Sinbi and his wife to Goku. Aureli identifies Sinbi as the scientist, and Goku inquires if he can fix his device. Sinbi wonders what it is, and Goku explains its purpose, but Sinbi, unfamiliar with Dragon Balls, finds it complicated. The baby, Turbo Noramaki, then cuts in, grasping the device to be a radar that detects a specific energy frequency. Sinbi, opening the device, is surprised to see its extremely advanced mechanism, and sits in awe at the idea of a girl named Bulma exceeding his own genius. At the same time, General Blue approaches Sinbi's house in the stolen car. Sinbi continues with his work on the radar, concerned about not being able to fix it. However, with a touch of magical assistance from Turbo, the radar is completed, surprising Sinbi. Meanwhile, Blue approaches the house and notices the plane, but also sees that Goku is present as well. Sinbi returns the fixed dragon radar to Goku, who's delighted to see that it really works again as cheers erupt from everyone. Goku then examines the radar, noticing that the Dragon Balls in Blue's possession are dangerously close to his location. Suddenly, Blue bursts in, seizing a Rayleigh and brandishes a knife at her head. Confusion ensues, but Goku, infuriated, demands the return of his Dragon Balls. Blue's eyes flash, immobilizing Goku with his psychic powers once more. Everyone wonders what's wrong, and Turbo recognizes the technique as Goku clarifies to Sinbi's family that General Blue is a bad guy. Blue then notices the radar in Goku's hands, snatches it from the boy, and expresses his intention to take the plane as well. Before leaving though, Blue states he forgot the most important thing, throws the Dragon Balls into the plane, and declares his intent to kill Goku. He delivers a powerful blow to the back of Goku's head as the boy falls to the ground, surprising Aureli and the others. Blue then slices a palm tree with his hand, threatening to skewer Goku with it. However, Sinbi urges Aureli to use her pro wrestling moves, and she rushes in, executing an Aureli kick to Blue's back, sending him hurtling into the air. Before he can land though, Aureli rushes forward and catches up to Blue, leaping into the air and headbutts him in the stomach, sending him flying far away from Penguin Village. Turbo uses his magical powers to grant Goku mobility again, and Aureli proudly reports her victory to him, surprising Goku, who says she's really strong. Aureli mentions all her friends are super strong as well, inspiring Goku to contemplate further training among such formidable individuals. Searching the plane, Goku discovers the bag with the Dragon Balls, but remembers the Dragon Radar was in Blue's pocket. Disappointed, Goku Goku anticipates the need for Bulma to create another radar, but notes that he doesn't know where she is, so there's nothing he can do. However, Turbo offers to make a new radar, utilizing parts from the plane. He says he learned how to do it by watching, and begins to telekinetically rip the plane apart, putting together a new radar for Goku. Goku confirms that the radar works exactly the same, and calls for the flying Nimbus, expressing gratitude to everyone. He then suggests that Aureli should participate in the next Tenkaichi Budokai and takes off bidding a farewell to everyone, leaving Sinbi pondering the mysterious kid. Blue, on the other hand, is still alive, revealing to the Red Ribbon Army that he doesn't have the Dragon Balls, but the Dragon Radar. Someone on the phone commands him to return immediately, but Blue's revealed to be in a desert, relaying the challenges he'll face in returning to headquarters. Much later, after collecting the three Dragon Balls from General Blue, Goku soars through the sky on the flying Nimbus, pondering whether the next Dragon Ball on the radar is his grandfather's four-star ball. Meanwhile at Red Ribbon Headquarters, Commander Red's assistant informs Red that Goku is heading west toward Captain Yellow's location. Red 
inquires about Yellow's progress in finding the Dragon Ball there, and Red's assistant reports they're still struggling. In the wooded area known as the Sacred Land of Corin, a towering Native American man guards a tower with a spear. A tiger and his men demand the Dragon Ball from him, but the man staunchly defends the Holy Land, warning them of dire consequences. Undeterred, the tiger persists and the man gives him and his group an ultimatum leave or die. A little Native American boy alerts his father to an approaching threat, and the man skillfully throws his spear, impaling an adversary through a tree. The Red Ribbon soldiers open fire on the man, but despite their futile attempts, they're no match for the man's strength. The man then swiftly delivers blows to the soldiers, and the tiger decides to retreat as the man watches him fly away in a plane. The little boy then approaches his father, who instructs him to wait while he buries the defeated intruders. The tiger, revealed to be Captain Yellow reports his failure to Commander Red's assistant, now known as Officer Black, who warns him of dire consequences if he doesn't succeed. Red then enters the scene, giving Yellow one last chance before calling someone named Mercenary Tao. Yellow, now frightened, is met with the same reaction by Officer Black, who questions if making such a move is really necessary. However, Commander Red says that should he need to call Tao, they'll be able to dispose of Goku and gather the Dragon Balls promptly. Met with the possibility of facing death at the hands of Tao should he fail. Captain Yellow contemplates taking the native's child hostage to secure the Dragon Ball. The little boy, cooking a fish over a small fire, dreams of being as strong as his father when Yellow swoops down in his plane, snatching him. The man hears his son scream, and Yellow demands the Dragon Ball, threatening the child's life. While Officer Black views this approach as advantageous listening in, Red is more concerned about son Goku. A Red Ribbon soldier then informs Red that Goku who is rapidly approaching Yellow's location, much to his disbelief. The man challenges Yellow to come down for the Dragon Ball, but Yellow insists on having it thrown up to him, as he'd be killed if he attempted to confront the man. Suddenly, Goku arrives at their location on Nimbus, spotting the plane and the crying boy. As he zooms in to investigate, Goku identifies the Red Ribbon plane, much to the surprise of Captain Yellow. Without hesitation, Goku then boards the plane and punches Yellow out. Goku then catches the little boy and greets him, as Officer Black on the other line notes they've lost communication, prompting Commander Red to order the call of Mercenary Tao. The native, now known as Bora, expresses his gratitude to Goku for saving his son, but Goku humbly mentions that he only wanted to help and defeat the Red Ribbon operative in the process. Goku then notices the ball in Bora's hand and requests to see it. To his immense joy, Goku realizes that he's finally found his grandpa's four-star ball, as Bora remains curious about the significance of the ball. Meanwhile, General Blue returns to the Red Ribbon headquarters in an air car. The guards at the gate fail to recognize him, leading to a threatening confrontation. Blue swiftly incapacitates one guard, berating them for forgetting their superior officer's face. The other guard recognizes General Blue, prompting Blue to order the opening of the gates. In Red's office, the assassin, Mercenary Tao, makes a dramatic entrance. Tao, an expensive hitman, discusses payment terms with Red. He proposes 100 million zenny for each kill, but due to his 20th anniversary assassin campaign, the price is reduced to 50 million zenny. Officer Black is skeptical about Tao's identity, and Tao challenges the officer to test his strength, though he declines. General Blue then enters the room, explaining the difficulties he faced in returning, but Red is solely concerned with the return of the Dragon Balls. Nervously, Blue presents the radar he obtained from Goku, but Red insists on inquiring the Dragon Balls, and proposes the death penalty as punishment for Blue's failure. However, Red gives Blue another chance, telling him that if he can defeat Mercenary Tao, his honor will be restored. The two face one another, with Tao playfully offering an autograph. Blue taunts the assassin, claiming to be the strongest, while Tao vows to defeat Blue using only his tongue. The fight begins, and Tao effortlessly dodges Blue's kick, using his tongue to pierce Blue's skull and kill him instantly. Tao revels in his victory, as Commander Red and Officer Black react with shock. Red Ready to take on his true objective, the three move outside as Black shows Tao a photo of Goku, warning him not to underestimate the kid as he's extremely powerful. Red instructs the mercenary to take the four Dragon Balls from Goku and tells him to kill anyone else who may get in the way. Black offers Tao a jet for his convenience, but Tao deems it too slow and demonstrates his strength by effortlessly breaking a pillar nearby. He says he should be back in about 30 minutes as he tosses the broken pillar into the air and jumps on top of 
it, speeding toward his destination. Back at the sacred land of Korin, Goku explains the significance of the Dragon Balls to Bora. Goku clarifies that he doesn't seek a wish, but rather his grandpa's memento, the four star ball. Goku then questions the tall pillar he's staring at, and Bora shares information about what's known as Korin Tower. He states that should anyone reach the top, there will be a noble guardian who resides there, offering holy water to enhance one's power exponentially. Bora reveals his family's generations long duty of protecting the holy tower, and impressed, Goku inquires if Bora has ever climbed to the top. Bora recounts a failed attempt in his youth due to the tower's height, and Goku wonders if he could use the flying Nimbus to get there. Meanwhile, Mercenary Tao approaches the tower on his flying pillar. Goku and Bora continue their discussion about the tower, while Bora's son spots something in the distance. Approaching rapidly, Tao leaps off the pillar, narrowly avoiding a collision as the trio move out of the way. The stranger greets the group, and Bora questions his identity as he introduces himself as the world's best assassin, Mercenary Tao. Bora wonders why a hitman would visit Korin's sacred land, but Tao clarifies that his target is the kid, Goku, as the Red Ribbon Army hired him to eliminate him. Goku, angered by the persistent threat of the army, stands as Bora's son pleads for his father to help. Bora insists on protecting the Holy Land as his duty and instructs his son, now known as Upa, to stand back. In an instant, Tao moves beside Bora, seizing the tip of his spear, much to the surprise of Goku, who marvels at his speed. Tao's grip on the weapon renders Bora immobile, and his immense power allows him to effortlessly lift the native into the air. The assassin then manipulates the spear with a swift jerk and sends Bora soaring skyward. Deciding to return the spear by hurtling it into the air, Goku calls on Nimbus to help, but by then, it's too late. Bora crashes to the ground, the spear etched through his heart, and Upa rushes to his side, distressed. In a surge of anger, Goku charges at Tao, attempting to attack. Tao, however, evades the attack, delivering a kick that sends Goku crashing into Korin Tower. The assassin assumes Goku to be dead, but Goku defiantly rises and unleashes a Kamehameha. Despite his minor surprise to the attack, Tao takes the blast head on, surviving though his clothes are torn. Without a moment's hesitation, Tao retaliates with a one-fingered Dodon Pa attack, hitting Goku head on and seemingly ending his life. Satisfied with his apparent success, Tao seizes the bag containing the Dragon Balls, convinced his mission is accomplished. Tao uproots the pillar he rode in on, signaling his departure, and Upa, grieving for his father and Goku, hurls a rock at him. Disregarding Upa's anger, Tao deflects the rock with his breath, hitting Upa in the face. He then callously advises him to be thankful he's still alive and takes off, leaving Upa alone at the foot of Korin Tower. At Red Ribbon Headquarters, Commander Red commends Tao's accomplishments, but the joy is short-lived when they realize that the radar displays only three Dragon Balls as Tao leaves the Sacred Land. The fourth Dragon Ball remains behind, angering Red. Tao, now in a small town, presents a tailor with a sketch of his old outfit, demanding a replica with the same design. When questioned how long it will take, the tailor tells him a week, to which Tao demands him to finish in three days. Following this, the assassin contacts Red Ribbon headquarters, informing them of his success in dealing with the kid and demanding payment in three days time. However, Red scolds him for only retrieving three Dragon Balls and notes the absence of the fourth one in the bag. Undeterred, Tao plans to circle back to Goku's body and retrieve it before his return to HQ pleasing Red, who revels in the army's victory. Meanwhile, Upa buries his father, wishing he'd been strong enough to protect him, and attempts to bury Goku. To his surprise though, Goku awakens. A hole in the boy's shirt reveals the four-star ball falling from it, indicating where the Dodon Pa struck, as it didn't hit the boy head on after all. Goku believes that his grandfather saved him, and observing Bora's grave, a moment of silence falls as Upa cries. Goku then makes up his mind, and resolves to gather all the Dragon Balls to revive Upa's father. Shocked, Upa wonders if this is really possible, and Goku confirms, stating that Shinron can make any wish come true. Upa informs Goku that Tao still possesses the bag with the remaining Dragon Balls, and Goku notices that he must have overlooked look the four star ball in his possession. Goku concludes that Tao will return for the four star ball and grows frustrated that his techniques prove ineffective against him. Upa then encourages Goku to climb Korin Tower, recalling the strength one gains at its summit by getting the holy water. Goku claims that it'd likely be easier to use the flying Nimbus to get there, but Upa explains that you have to climb the tower without any assistance. Goku, determined to use his
his own power, places the four star ball in a pouch, and instructs Upa to hide if things become dangerous. Initiating his ascent with a jump, Goku climbs Korin Tower, surprising Upa, who notes he's already out of view. Goku progresses rather quickly at first, but as time passes, the boy's ascent is rather slow, shifting from day to night and back as he faces the challenges of hunger and fatigue. Eventually, more time passes with climbing, and Goku finally reaches the summit of Korin Tower. Climbing through one of the holes in the floor, Goku appears in a neat looking room with amenities and large pots. He searches for the water that will increase his power in the pots, but suddenly hears a voice that calls him upstairs. Climbing the steps, Goku encounters a spacious, round room devoid of walls, featuring only railings and pillars supporting the ceiling. Standing in front front of him, an elderly cat holding a staff eagerly awaits, expressing admiration for Goku's swift ascent to his tower. Curious about the transformative water, Goku inquires about it, prompting the cat to introduce it as the supreme holy water in a jar at the room's center. Before indulging though, the cat questions Goku on his intentions, and he begins to disclose his quest for the Dragon Balls. However, the cat interrupts him, telling Goku to be quiet for a moment. Silence falls between the two, and the cat reveals that Goku is collecting the Dragon Balls to revive Upa's father, but in order to do that, he must defeat Mercenary Tao first. Shocked that the cat could know such a thing without him speaking, Goku questions this, and the cat tells him he's able to read people's hearts. Knowing now that Goku comes with pure intentions, Goku moves to drink some of the water, but the cat questions his ability to do so, stating that he won't allow him to do it. The cat then uses his staff to knock Goku off of the jar, surprising the boy, who was just told he could have it. Goku attempts to jump toward the jar once more, but is kicked away by the cat and lands on his feet. Questioning the cat's motives once more, Goku grows angry, but the feline tells him he can drink all he wants so long as he doesn't let him get in his way. Goku attempts to divert the cat's attention, but as he jumps toward the jar again, his efforts are thwarted, the entity exclaiming that he can read the hearts of others so he wouldn't fall for such a cheap trick. The cat then uses his staff to grab the jar and move it away from Goku, who vows to take the jar by force. Under Third, Goku persists in his efforts, employing various tactics. The cat, wielding his staff and the jar alike, evades Goku's attempts effortlessly, stating that at this rate, Goku won't be able to catch him at all. The boy expresses his hunger, and the cat provides him with a bean to fill him up. When questioned what this will do for him, the cat reveals that it's a very helpful bean, capable of keeping anyone from going hungry for 10 days. After consuming it, Goku rejuvenates himself, much to his surprise, but is still unable to obtain the water after many attempts. Fatigued, Goku inquires if he's the first to reach the top of the tower, and the cat tells him he isn't and that someone else arrived 300 years ago. Shocked at the time span, Goku questions the cat's age, to which the feline reveals he's 800 years old. He says that in the way that Goku moves, he's realized that the one who reached the tower 300 years ago was none other than his teacher, Master Roshi. Goku is surprised to learn that Roshi managed to reach the tower and drink the water under the cat's tutelage, and the cat reveals himself as Korin. Goku questions Korin on how long it took Master Roshi to get the water, to which Korin holds up three fingers, leading Goku to believe it took three minutes. However, Korin corrects the boy, stating that it took his master three years. Goku is astonished that it took Master Roshi three years, while Korin speculates about the duration it would take Goku. Expressing impatience, Goku decides to take things seriously, prompting Korin to tell him that all he'll need to do is take the water from him. Employing the after image technique, Goku splits himself into multiple images, impressing Korin with the technique. Korin attempts a jump kick to find the real Goku, but misses an after image. Goku, diving from above, moves in to snatch the jar from Korin, but moves straight through him and hits the ground, having been tricked with a counter after image from the feline. Though initially mocking Goku, Korin thinks to himself that this is the first time he's seen the after image technique applied so well, and says he's excited to see what Goku can do. Goku, already out of breath, learns about the thinner air at the tower's summit. Korin also points out that Goku's needless movements fail him, so it's no surprise he's running out of breath so quickly. He goes on to state that Goku hasn't noticed yet, but he's already demonstrated an increase in strength due to his ascent to this part of the tower. Displaying Goku's pouch containing the Dragon Ball, Korin notes they'll have to do some more training, surprising Goku, who ponders how he grabbed it from him. Korin then tosses the Dragon Ball over the edge of the tower, prompting Goku's frantic descent to recover 
over it, fearing the Red Ribbon Army's interference. Goku then hastily makes his way back to the Tower Summit, questioning Korin on why he would do such a thing. Korin finds amusement in Goku's efforts and points out the improved speed of his round trip. The first time Goku ascended, it took him nearly a day, but now it's only taken him three hours. Korin suggests they continue with their training, and Goku continues to struggle as the chase resumes until nightfall, with both resting. Goku, waking up, contemplates taking the water, but refrains, opting to get it without resorting to cheating. Korin, who was actually awake the whole time, notes Goku's honesty compared to Master Roshi. The pursuit resumes the next day, and Goku, determined, attacks Korin relentlessly. Near the railing, Goku playfully tickles Korin, causing him to drop his staff in the jar from the summit's railing. Goku leaps to catch them, much to the shock of Korin, who notes he'll fall if he goes any further. However, Goku catches the staff in jar, clinging to the railing with his tail. Korin is astounded that it only took Goku three days to grab the jar, and seeking approval, Goku questions whether he can drink it, to which Korin gives the go-ahead. Goku drinks the water, and though expecting immediate changes, the boy feels nothing, only to discover that the super holy water is just ordinary water. This revelation shocks Goku, but Korin clarifies that his strength has already increased exponentially, as the real power came from Goku's training on the tower. Grateful, Goku leaves prepare to unveil the fruits of his training, and Korin reflects on how Goku has already surpassed Master Roshi. At the tower's base, Upa scouts the area and runs around with a small tomahawk, gazing upward and pondering if Goku has reached the summit after three days. Meanwhile, Mercenary Tao dons his completed outfit and readies himself to depart for the Dragon Ball. When questioned for payment by the tailor, Tao scoffs at the request, asserting his status as the world's renowned hitman. The tailor insists on needing money to to survive, leading Tao to opt for an unconventional payment method. He says that rather than pay, he'll kill anyone the tailor wants, but the tailor refuses, noting he doesn't have anyone in mind. Swiftly, Tao then jabs his finger into the tailor's forehead, instantly ending his life. Soon after, Upa continues observing the tower, when Tao's pillar crashes to the ground again. The assassin, having returned, stands in front of the boy as he vows revenge for his father's death. Disregarding this, Tao demands the remaining dragon ball from Upa, who retaliates by throwing his tomahawk. However, Tao effortlessly dodges the attack, executing a sweep kick on Upa. Seizing him by the neck, Tao interrogates Upa about the Dragon Ball, but Upa refuses to clue him in. Convinced that Upa desires death, Tao hurls him toward the tower. Suddenly, Goku, diving toward the ground, calls for the flying Nimbus and catches Upa before he collides with the tower. Ecstatic to see Goku, Upa cheers as Tao sits in awe, curious on how Goku managed to survive. Upa questions Goku on if he was able to enhance his strength at the tower summit, and Goku confirms. Goku then lands in front of Tao, exclaiming, he's the one who possesses the Dragon Ball. Tao expresses shock at Goku's survival of his Dodon Pa, and Goku reveals that the Dragon Ball in his pocket saved him. Tao attributes the boy's survival to luck, but states that this is where it runs out, as miracles don't happen twice. He demands Goku to hand over the Dragon Ball quietly, but Goku refuses, confidently stating that Tao won't be able to beat him again. Laughing at the remark, the assassin warns Goku that he'll finish him in a mere three seconds, and charges in. However, However, Goku leans backward, avoiding Tao's punch and counterattacks, sending him airborne. Goku stands up, leaps into the air, and kicks Tao toward the tower mid-flight, sending him slamming into it. As Tao lands, Goku mocks him, stating that his three seconds are already up. Tao wonders how Goku could have grown so strong in such a short period of time, but Goku reveals he was training at the top of the tower. Tao then thinks to himself that he'd heard of Korin in the past, but didn't think he'd actually be in a place like this. Soon readying himself for the confrontation, Tao towers over Goku, anticipating a little exercise in battling this strange fighter. Despite Tao's incessant boasting, Goku urges him to stop talking and face him. After a brief exchange of words, Tao attacks Goku, but Goku adeptly blocks all his strikes and delivers a powerful kick to the assassin's face. Undeterred, Tao launches another assault, prompting Goku to leap into the air. In response, Tao follows suit and punches Goku toward the tower. However, 
Goku, using the tower as a springboard, retaliates with a punch of his own and sends Tao head first into the ground. Emerging with tattered clothes once again, Tao claims he was holding back due to Goku's age and proceeds to remove his shirt. He then exclaims that he's going all out now and launches a Dodon Pa, but this time, Goku extends his hands and catches it without much difficulty. The blast pushes him back slightly as he only experiences mild soreness in his hands. Tao is astonished, questioning how the boy was able to do such a thing, and Goku points out the reversal of effectiveness, noting that Tao's attack failed this time. Upa expresses delight at the turn of events, and Tao retrieves a capsule from his pants, unleashing a sword. He swings the blade at Goku, who narrowly evades each strike. Tao slices through a tree and cuts some of Goku's hair in the process, reveling in the efficiency of the sword. The mercenary continues his assault on Goku, but Upa, reacting to the situation, leaps from the flying Nimbus and provides Goku with his power pole. Mid-air, Goku leaps from the tower and catches the weapon as Tao charges in once more. Tao continues his assault, but a single strike from the power pole is enough to cleave his sword in half. Having removed the obstacle, Goku then dismisses the power pole and declares his intent to defeat the mercenary with his bare hands. Tao questions Goku on if he truly believes he can beat him with just his bare hands, and Goku affirms, urging the assassin to make his move. Tao then charges at Goku, landing a punch to his face and following it up with a forceful kick that sends Goku backward. Unrelenting, Tao delivers a powerful blow to Goku's gut, initiating a relentless pummeling. As Tao lifts Goku by the neck, Upa observes in bewilderment as the assassin kicks Goku into the air and slams him down to the ground. In a final move, Tao dives in to finish Goku and knees him in the stomach. Confident in his impending victory, Tao laughs only to be surprised when Goku stands up with a smile praising Tao's efforts. Goku then declares his counterattack and charges at Tao, delivering a powerful gut punch, chopping at the sides of Tao's neck and finishing it off with a kick to the face. Perplexed, Tao marvels at Goku's speed as the boy prepares himself for his next attack. Contemplating his next move though, Tao decides to surrender. He drops to his knees, begs for forgiveness, and vows to abandon his evil ways, much to Goku's surprise. Caught in uncertainty, Goku looks to Upa for what to do next, but seizing the opportunity, Tao cunningly throws a grenade at Goku, then leaps into the air to avoid the blast. However, Goku adeptly kicks the grenade back at Tao, causing a dramatic explosion. When the smoke clears, Goku and Upa rejoice in Tao's defeat. Goku secures his power pole on his back and assures Upa that he'll gather all the Dragon Balls to revive his father, much to the boy's satisfaction. Examining the Dragon Radar, Goku wonders about the close proximity of the next two Dragon Balls, deducing that they must be located at the Red Ribbon Army's headquarters. Determined to retrieve the Dragon Balls, Goku decides to confront and defeat everyone there, despite Upa's concern. Upa urges Goku to flee if the situation gets dangerous, and undeterred, Goku summons the Flying Nimbus. At Red Ribbon Headquarters, Colonel Violet returns with the Five Star Ball and reports its easy retrieval using the enemy's radar. Commander Red then instructs Officer Black to hand over the radar to General Copper for locating the final Dragon Ball. The movement of the four Dragon Balls then catches the group's attention, and Red suspects that Mercenary Tao is on his way back. Meanwhile, Goku continues on Nimbus when a small small robot plane approaches him. At Kame House, Bulma has set up radar satellite equipment and informs Master Roshi and Launch that Goku is on the TV. Wondering where he's going, Bulma switches to a radar feed, noting Goku's direction toward two other Dragon Balls in the distance. Launch speculates if Goku is headed toward Red Ribbon Headquarters, prompting Bulma to send the surveillance robot to investigate. The robot takes off away from a confused Goku, the boy noting that it's a lot faster than Nimbus. The robot hovers over Red Ribbon Headquarters headquarters, displaying the base's image on Bulma's screen. However, it gets destroyed by a red ribbon plane, leading the control room to dismiss it as a mere surveillance device. Officer Black informs Commander Red that the four Dragon Balls are at their location, and Red once again assumes Mercenary Tao's arrival. Spotting the base, Goku brandishes the power pole, exclaiming he's ready for action. A red ribbon soldier in a plane mistakes Goku for Mercenary Tao, but quickly realizes his error upon Goku's swift 
fast movements. Back at Kame House, Boma fears for Goku's safety, and Master Roshi decides they should help him. However, lacking transportation, the group ponder their options. Boma decides to call Yamcha for help, but faces the dilemma of having no phone. Following the turtle's suggestion, she builds a makeshift phone and contacts Yamcha, who agrees to help Goku upon learning about the Red Ribbon Army. Yamcha rallies Oolong and Poir, noting he was planning to leave the city anyway out of boredom. A Red Ribbon soldier then informs Commander Red that the possessor of the four Dragon Balls isn't Mercenary Tao, but Son Goku, who's headed their way. Goku soars into action, initiating his assault on Red Ribbon headquarters, as Commander Red and Officer Black ponder on Mercenary Tao's death. Red urges his men to stop Goku from taking another step into Red Ribbon territory, and traces his location to the terrace in Sector 12. Swiftly, Goku knocks out a gunman and jumps between opponents, delivering powerful kicks along the way. Progressing through the facility, Goku reaches a balcony, checks the radar, and leaps across rooftops. Spotting him, some soldiers open fire, but Goku skillfully evades the bullets and reaches a tower. Three small air tanks appear, firing at him, but Goku quickly incapacitates one by knocking out the pilot. Jumping off, he lets it crash into a roof and proceeds to use a Kamehameha to obliterate the second, causing the third to crash into a tower. Upon landing, Goku dispatches another soldier, prompting a tiger-like individual to warn that Goku is now on the ground. The soldier informs Red that Goku is headed for Building 8, prompting Red to suggest that the boy is after the Dragon Balls. Black suggests taking refuge below ground, but Red dismisses the idea, boasting about the Red Ribbon Army's invincibility. Goku continues his rampage, eliminating ground soldiers, while the radar indicates that the Dragon Balls are in Building 8. A nearby sniper takes aim and shoots at Goku, provoking his anger, much to his surprise. At the same time, the soldier reports Goku's entry into Building 8, prompting Red and Black to rush toward the location. At Kame House, Yamcha arrives in a plane and urges everyone to board. Inside, Bulma and Oolong express reluctance about heading into danger, but Yamcha reminds them that Goku's helped them all in the past. The turtle questions his inclusion, receiving no response, while Yamcha questions where Krillin is. Master Roshi informs him that Krillin went swimming to grab groceries as they don't have a boat anymore, prompting Yamcha to acknowledge his strength and state they need him for the battle. Meanwhile, Red and Black arrive in Building 8, with Red unwilling to hand over the Dragon Balls. Black then states that the army is in trouble, as Goku's strength surpassed their expectations and notes he's already wiped out the main members of the army. At the same time, Krillin is picked up by Yamcha and the others, filled in on the situation with Goku and the Red Ribbon Army. At the fray, Goku elbows another soldier and realizes he needs to go higher. Spotting a room with no stairs, he jumps through the ceiling, surprising the other officers and leaving Red infuriated as he watches Goku's assault on the monitor. Goku swiftly incapacitates soldiers, delivering kicks and punches with precision. When some soldiers behind a table fire a rocket at him, Goku survives unscathed and retaliates, angrily smashing the table against the wall and crushing the soldiers. Two remaining soldiers in the room hastily retreat, infuriating Red, who watches the chaos unfold. Black informs Red that all their remaining soldiers are fleeing as well, and Red is astounded that such a commotion is caused by just one kid. Black suggests a hasty retreat, but unable to bear the situation, Red refuses and reveals his true motive behind gathering the Dragon Balls to increase his height. Black expresses his belief that they were to wield the Dragon Balls to rule the world, but Red exclaims they could have done that without a wish, and insists that his short stature makes him unpopular with women. Black questions if this is truly the reason their commander made them all suffer, and recounting childhood teasing due to his height, Red dismisses Black's notion of world conquest, asserting his authority as the commander. Black continues his questioning, noting the amount of sacrifices and losses for such a selfish wish, but Red, unrelenting, puts the blame of countless dead soldiers on the fallen, exclaiming they didn't train hard enough to defeat their enemies. In response, Black reaches his limit, shooting Red in the head and claiming he has no right to be commander. Black declares he'll become the new commander and rule the world himself as Goku arrives on the scene, questioning the location
location of the Dragon Balls. Goku wonders if Black is the boss, and Black confirms, stating he just became one a moment ago. He then proposes a partnership with Goku to seize the Dragon Balls and rule the world, but Goku remains resolute, stating that he intends to use the Dragon Balls to revive Upa's father. Despite Black's attempts to sway him, offering to revive Upa's father and conquer the world after, Goku refuses, exclaiming he doesn't work with bad guys. This refusal prompts a confrontation, as Black swings at Goku, who effortlessly dodges the attacks and counters with a powerful elbow to the gut. Reeling, Black ponders on Goku's power, and Goku urges the officer to surrender. Instead, Black deploys a capsule, summoning a battle jacket, a formidable giant mecha. Black enters the battle jacket and delivers a forceful punch to Goku's face. Meanwhile, the rest of the group continue their journey toward the Red Ribbon headquarters, Krillin noting that Goku may already be dead. Black fires a blast from the battle jacket's arm, which Goku manages to dodge. However, Black seizes Goku with the other arm and hurls him through the wall onto the terrace, threatening to kill him once and for all. Ascending through the ceiling, Black launches another blast down at Goku from the air as it collides with the building the boy sat in front of. The aftermath reveals an empty crater, leading Black to believe he's won, but Goku, still alive, appears at the top of a tower. Noting that the enemy shouldn't underestimate his speed, Goku leaps on top of the battle jacket, shocking Black, who attempts a strike, but he smashes through the protective glass and punches himself in the face. Goku, hanging from a rail on the battle jacket's stomach, laughs at the comical turn of events, and Black rockets even higher, prompting Goku to observe from a rooftop. In a bold move, Black resorts to using a missile to destroy Goku along with the Red Ribbon base, as he leans forward and prepares the jacket's launch. Black then fires the massive projectile, prompting Goku to recognize the weapon and kick it into the distance, resulting in a colossal detonation on a mountain nearby. Fearing the true might of Goku's power, Black decides to retreat, but Goku, determined to wipe out the Red Ribbon army entirely, leaps from the roof in pursuit. The boy rapidly closes in and crashes through the battle jacket, causing it to explode and kill Officer Black. Unharmed and riding the flying Nimbus, Goku soon retrieves the two Dragon Balls from inside the building as the others rush to join him. Remaining at Red Ribbon headquarters, Goku consults the Dragon Radar in search of the last Dragon Ball, but it fails to register. Suddenly, Yamcha and the others arrive in the plane to rescue Goku, landing outside of Red Ribbon territory to avoid being shot down. Before proceeding, Master Roshi suggests devising a plan, and Yamcha concurs. Oolong, wishing them good luck, is goaded by Bulma to join, faking a stomach ache initially, but is called out on his lies. Anticipating the raid with bloodthirsty enthusiasm, Launch, in her aggressive form, expresses her eagerness to kill some people. As the group discuss their plan, which includes Master Roshi suggesting Bulma distract the guards by getting naked, Krillin looks to the sky and suddenly urges everyone to hide. However, the group spot Goku approaching, much to their surprise. Goku, thinking the Dragon Radar is malfunctioning, believes he'll need Bulma to fix it again, but has no idea where Kame House is from Red Ribbon HQ. The group come out from hiding and call to Goku from the ground, and the boy notices them, surprised to see everyone there. Krillin explains they came to help to fight the Red Ribbon Army, and Yamcha states it's a good thing Goku decided not to go in there alone. Goku, however, reveals he did go in, managed to defeat the entire army alone, and grab the six Dragon Balls, shocking everyone. Yamcha tells Poir to fly into the base to verify, and after some time, he returns, confirming Goku's claims. Astonished by his feat, everyone wonders how Goku managed to do such a thing, and Goku asserts he's become stronger, having climbed Korin Tower and consumed the strange water. Goku then shares with Bulma the Dragon Radar predicament, and Bulma inquires if Goku managed to find his grandfather's four-star memento. Goku confirms he has the four-star ball, but is committed to using all seven to revive Upa's dad, slain by the Red Ribbon Army. Bulma suggests returning to Master Roshi's house to repair the radar, and everyone boards the plane as Goku rides the flying Nimbus. During the journey, Master Roshi acknowledges Goku's newfound strength, noting he's likely surpassed him by now. Roshi states he wouldn't have had the stamina to take on the entire Red Ribbon Army by himself, and says that Goku's strength knows no bounds. Yamcha then expresses that they'll never be able to defeat Goku in the Tenkaichi Budokai if they slow down their training, a fact 
confirmed by Roshi. Yamcha then says he'll tag along with Goku to train and find the remaining Dragon Ball, and Krillin says he'll go too. Back at Kame House, Bulma opens the radar, only to find that it's not broken at all. Questioning why the remaining Dragon Ball won't show up though, Bulma suspects that something must have swallowed it. Yamcha inquires about this, and Bulma explains, stating that if the distinct radio waves emitted by the Dragon Balls are blocked by biological matter, the radar won't catch it. Oolong dismisses the idea of someone swallowing the Dragon Ball, but Bulma considers the possibility of a crocodile or a hippo doing so. She proposes giving up their search, but Goku, concerned, wonders what he'll do. Master Roshi then proposes a visit to fortune teller Baba's palace, as she's known for her fortune telling abilities. He goes on to state that whenever he loses something, Baba is usually on the mark, able to reveal its location. Consulting a map, Roshi directs the group to the location, but Goku, unable to read a map, is assisted by Yamcha, who offers to tag along with him. Krillin, Goku, Yamcha, and Poir then board Yamcha's plane, leaving behind Bulma and the others on their quest for the remaining Dragon Ball. The group then continue their journey, ready to face whatever destiny has in store for them at Fortune Teller Baba's palace. The Red Ribbon Army arc may have started out slow for some, but its comedic relief and connection to past and new characters really shows how much fun Toriyama had in working on this part of the story. The connection to Goku's Saiyan nature to be revealed was also amazing as well. The boy Boy's rampage on Red Ribbon HQ confirmed Raditz's thought process in how the Saiyans expected Goku to have conquered the Earth by the time they arrived. But what did you think of this arc? Was it your favorite? Let me know down in the comments below. Thanks so much for watching, like and subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you guys next time.